Good day, everyone. Uh, welcome. My name is Peter Murray, and I am the MC for this first part of Code for Lib Day 4. Uh, it's been my pleasure, along with Kerry Gordon, to co-chair the Code for Lib 2021 Planning Committee. As we close out the main conference today, uh, please start making a list of what you liked about this year's event, uh, what you didn't like, and what you might want to see from this fully virtual event carry forward when we are able to meet again in person. Uh, the planning committee will be very eager to get that feedback for next year's planning. Uh, and if you feel really passionate about it, uh, there's a new Slack channel called the uh, Future of Code for LibCon and possibly a gathering in a month or two to talk through the options. As with all Code for Lib events, please be mindful of the code of conduct so that we are a welcoming space for all working in library technology. We have our community support squad here to assist attendees. You can find their schedules and photos in the conduct and safety section of the website. The community support volunteers for the first half of today are Sean Avercamp, uh, known on Slack as Savercamp, S-A-V-E-R-K-A-M-P, and Wayne Graham, known on Slack simply as Wayne, W-A-Y-N-E. If you've hit the information overload wall during the conference, uh, remember that if you need to take a break uh, from the talks, the virtual quiet room on Whova has a variety of quieter, meditative, and restorative activities uh, to help you rest up for the next batch of talks. Uh, the talks are all recorded. Uh, so you'll be able to catch up on anything you might have missed during your break. You can find the virtual quiet room page under the logistics menu option in Whova. That's it for the morning announcements. Uh, so let's move right into our closing keynote. Uh, as with all of our sessions, uh, please feel free to engage in conversation with the other participants in the chat window in Whova or in Slack. If you have any questions for Dr. Uh, Gong, please help me by using the Q&A window in Whova. Uh, we will have plenty of time for questions after the pre-recorded video. And as with all of our other sessions, this keynote is being recorded and will be available at a later date on the Code for Live YouTube channel. Regina Gong is the Open Educational Resources and Student Success Library, Librarian at Michigan State University. Before coming to Michigan State, Regina worked at Lansing uh, Community College as head of technical services and systems. While there, she also led and implemented the OER program at Lansing's Open as Lansing's Open Educational Resources Project Manager. Regina is actively involved in the open education community and has done numerous national presentations, keynotes, webinars, and workshops on OER, open education, open educational practices, and women of color in OER. Regina ser currently serves at, on the Open Education Conference Steering Committee, the Open Education Conference Strategic Planning Committee, SPARC Open Education Advisory Group, and a faculty for the Association of American Colleges and Universities Institute for Open Educational Resources. Previously, she was a member of the SPARC Steering Committee and the Community College Consortium for Open Educational Resources, where she served as a vice president for professional development for three years. Regina also provides leadership to the statewide Michigan OER network 
uh, community of practice and a coalition of, of OER advocates across K through 12 in Michigan. She's also a recipient of the OER Research Group Fellowship and is a global OER graduate network member. Regina obtained her master's in library and information science at Wayne State University, shout out to Wayne State, and is currently pursuing a PhD in higher education administration at Michigan State University. And you can follow her on Twitter at D-R-G-O-N-G. -G. So Regina, welcome. Let's hear your keynote. Hello, everyone. My name is Regina Gong. I am the Open Educational Resources and Student Success Librarian at Michigan State University. While we meet today on a virtual platform, I would like to take this moment to acknowledge the importance of the lands with which we each call home and the indigenous peoples of all the lands that we are on today. With this land acknowledgement, I hope we can take action to support our indigenous communities. I'd like to begin by extending my gratitude to all of you, the Code for Live community, for voting for me as one of your keynote speakers. This is actually my first time attending a Code for Live conference, and I never could have imagined that I would do so as a keynote speaker. So thank you for that. I wanna thank the conference planning committee and the conference organizers for putting together this virtual conference. Hopefully next year, we can all meet in person. What I will be talking about in this presentation is informed by what I do as a librarian and as an OER advocate. First, at a community college, and now at the research university. More importantly, it is what I hope would happen as we re-emerge from the devastating effect of this pandemic, that we can reimagine what education can be for us in the future. But first, I would like to tell you about my story. It is my story of how I came to be in this country it was a life-changing opportunity and one that changed the trajectory of my life. I was born and raised in the Philippines and I came here to the U.S. as a skilled worker. I was an H-1B visa holder because Innovative Interfaces Incorporated hired me back in 2000 as a systems librarian doing help desk support for their products. It was back in the day when Triple I was still privately owned. It was a small company and everyone knew each other. It was also then, it was also there where I met my husband. We were both hired outside of the US and worked at the help desk at the same time. We didn't stay long there though. It was just a little over two years and eventually we move here in Michigan. I'm telling you this part of my story because looking back, I didn't know that open and openness played a role. The open part of it was more of a mindset and attitude that my then employer and I practice. We were willing to open our minds to new experiences on my part, working for a vendor and on Triple I, hiring someone outside of their hiring norms. It opened new opportunities for me that felt empowering as I learned and experienced how it was to work from the other side of the library ecosystem. Going back to the title of my talk about open education as a catalyst for change, in education. What do I mean by that? As a community that has a solid commitment to, to open technologies, you know the value and importance of open source, open platforms, open systems that allow experts like you 
who write code and programs the ability to adapt, revise, and see what's inside the black box. This openness enables you to improve and customize it based on your needs. This is what open education enables us to do. However, the word open is a contested term. It is literally open to a lot of interpretations, and I'm not here to offer a way of defining it. However, I would like to contextualize what open education means. So let's look at this definition from the European Commission's Joint Research Center on Open EDU Framework. And I read, open education is seen as a way of carrying out education, often enabled by digital technologies. The aim is to widen access and participation to everyone by removing barriers and making learning accessible abundant and customizable for all. It offers multiple ways of teaching and learning, building and sharing knowledge. It also provides for a variety of access routes to formal and informal education and connects the two. This is another definition from the Open Education Consortium. We can see here three components of open education and I highlighted it in red. Those are resources, tools, and practices. Open education encompasses resources, tools, and practices that employ the framework of open sharing to improve educational access and effectiveness worldwide. And then this is another definition from the Cape Town Open Education Declaration. Open education is not limited to just open educational resources. It also draws upon technologies that facilitate collaborative, flexible learning, and open sharing of teaching practices that empower educators to benefit from the best ideas of their colleagues. In this definition, we can see that open education we can see what open education can do. And in looking at all those definitions that I've just shown you earlier, we can see that open education is a movement, it's a philosophy, and more importantly, it's a broad and expanding set of value-driven practices. In the next slide, I will show the different dimensions of open education. So another good way of looking at the many aspects of open education is through this diagram. There's a lot to unpack here, but I think it is a good way of seeing what constitutes the dimensions of open education, what's, what's inside the big umbrella of open education. So we can see here that there are six core dimensions around open education. So that's content, pedagogy, recognition, collaboration, research, and access. All of them are interrelated and intersecting. Together, they contribute to, towards opening up education in a holistic way. But for this presentation, I will concentrate on content which are OER, and pedagogy, which are open educational practices, and collaboration as well. So exactly a year ago, because of the COVID-19 pandemic, schools, K-12 and higher education, had to go on on an emergency remote education, or what we then called pivot online. Please note that emergency remote education is not the same as distance education or online learning. Emergency remote education was literally, we are going to try to recreate our face-to-face -face class in an online environment. And as you probably know, not many teachers and students were prepared for what it would entail. The move to emergency remote learning and with the online learning environment that is happening now presented all sorts of divides. So we can see here the broadband divide, device divide, access divide. So a lot of our students don't have the access to culturally re relevant content. So we have that divide too. Materials in home language divide and certainly the walled garden divide. 
we have witnessed the devastating effects of the COVID-19 pandemic, which we all have been going through for more than a year now. And with the shift to remote learning, the demand for digital materials has intensified. Academic libraries scrambled to provide electronic copies of textbooks. At, MS at MSU, we had to scan portions of our textbooks that are on reserve so our faculty can put this into our learning management system for students to have access to. What many people, and certainly our faculty, don't know that the problem isn't that we cannot buy electronic copies of these materials, but we can, you know, we can, but we couldn't. So why is that? This is a statement from the Guelph, from the University of Guelph Library. They put out a statement out there because they were getting a lot of um, inquiries from their faculty as to why they cannot just access or they cannot just buy um, textbooks in print um, in, you know, in the digital format. And they wrote in here that approximately 85% of existing course textbooks are simply unavailable to libraries in any other format than print. Textbook publishers have built their profit models around selling e-textbooks directly to students. And despite this, we also know that the cost of textbooks and other course materials represent a major financial hurdle for our students. So they even decided to name names, listing the publishers unwilling to sell library ebook versions to them. And so, you know, publishers like Pearson, Cengage, McGraw-Hill, Oxford University Press Canada, Elsevier in Prince, were some of some just some of the publishers who were not willing to sell um, e-textbooks to them. And as a result, many other institutions follow their lead and put out and put out a statement as well in their websites. So we have Grand Valley State University, California State University, and University of Rochester, among others. That's why the need and importance of OER has never been greater at this time. I've seen it in my own institution at MSU with many of our faculty increasingly use OER in several and in several community colleges as well. This image illustrates in very clear terms the idea of OER, what it is about and what it can do. So essentially OER are teaching and learning resources that can either be in the public domain or those materials that are um, issued with open licenses mostly Creative Commons licenses. This allows people to do what we call the five R's or the ability to retain, reuse, revise, remix, and redistribute. The overarching idea that undergirds OER is that education is sharing. This is from the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation. This is um, the Hewlett Foundation is one of the philanthropic organizations that has been funding open, ed open education projects um, through the years. And it says here that the idea behind OER is simple but powerful. These digital materials have the potential to give people everywhere equal ac access to our collective knowledge and provide many more people around the world with access to quality education. So we can see here a, world a word cloud of all the things that OER enable us to do. We have here free, we have participatory, inclusive, um, collaborative, ability, cost ability to customize, and many more. But while, but while OER enables all these things to happen, it is not a panacea. OER is not a magic bullet that can solve the inequality and inequity equity problems in higher education, but I do believe that it can help eliminate some of the barriers that our students and learners have been experiencing. 
So let's move from our discussion of resources to practice. In particular, open educational practices or OEP. I believe that one of the things that OER facilitates is that it allows educators to engage in meaningful educational practices that are open and connected. In the next slides, I will show you what OEP is all about. So this is from Catherine Cronin. Catherine does a lot of research on open educational practices and open pedagogy. And she says that open education is a broad descriptor of practices that include the creation, use, and reuse of OER, as well as open pedagogies and open, and open sharing of teaching practices. Here in this next definition from the Open Education Quality or OPAL initiative, open education practices are ones that are supporting the reuse and production of OER through institutional policies that promote innovative pedagogical models and respect and empower learners as co-producers on their lifelong learning path. And this one is from the Open eLearning Content Observatory Services. They, they created a roadmap for people who want to implement OER. And they say here that the practices that involve students in active, constructive engagement with content, tools, and services in the learning process and promote learners' self-management, creativity, and working in teams. So the shift to OER has enabled educators to engage in open educational practices that resulted in the epistemological valuing of student knowledge. I'm reminded of the banking model of education that Paulo Freire has written in his book, Pedagogy of the Oppress. So here, the banking model was Freire's critic of the traditional education system, wherein students are just containers into which educators can deposit knowledge. OEP engages students so that they are active participants in the learning process, which leads to more engagement and with the, co with the content, tools, and activities in the courses that they are taking. So I'm just going to show you some of the example projects that showcases the application of OEP. So you'll see here in this slide, um, the open pedagogy notebook. Um, this is some, uh, this site has um, some real world examples of open educational practices that many educators have submitted. So this is like here in the US and other um, educators outside of the US as well. So this resource is growing and as more and more educators submit their ideas, a lot of people try to replicate it in their own context, in their own institutions. So this is another example and this open pedagogy approach um, ebook or OER is um, comes from the the SUNY um, system and this is edited by Alexis Clifton and Kimberly Davis Huffman. This one showcases examples of faculty, librarian, and students collaboration in open pedagogy and OEP projects. So in here you will find a lot of examples of how um, faculty, librarians, and students collaborate together to create um, projects that showcases their collaborative work. This one, the DS106, um, is an assignment bank that started from um, the digital storytelling class and at the University of Mary Washington in spring 2010. So DS106 is a crowdsource student created remixable set of assignments that spans visual, audio, design, you know, mash up, even 3D printed assignments. So this is really a treasure trove 
of materials that are created by students for students so that it can be adopted by educators wherever they may be. And this one is an example of the learning community. So the open educational practices learning community that I am facilitating this academic year at MSU. So this learning community brings together educators who are using OER and would like to leverage the affordances that openly licensed materials and open education can give. So specifically, we want to learn how to involve our students in the co-creation of knowledge, as well as sharing practices that demonstrate effective student participation and engagement. So this is a community of faculty who are using um, OER in their courses. And currently now we have um, 15 faculty who are doing the learning community with me. So we meet every month and we think of ways where we can um, devise some learning activities that they can use in class that involves students so that we can um, foster more student engagement in their courses. So this one is from our um, open textbooks publishing at MSU, which I also manage. Um, the one in the middle, the hookup culture OER, is actually an example of a student created OER. So um, this one was a course called IAH231B. And the professor, Dr. Denise Acevedo, decided that it might be better to have the students create the materials that they were be, that they will be using for the class. And so um, the students contributed to the creation of this book. That's why um, you know this is our first um, student created um, textbook using um, OEP as a model. So now that we've seen some ways in which open is being practiced, let us look at some open online community building and engagement resources that we can all use, even if we're not teaching formal college course. So even, even if we're not teachers, a lot of um, this um, materials that I will be showing to you or these projects can be adaptable, um, whatever your context may be. So whether you're a student, whether you're um, a teacher or whether you're a lifelong learner, you can all take something out of this. So this one is called Equity Unbound. It is an emergent collaborative curriculum which aims to um, create equity focused, open and connected intercultural, intercultural learning experiences across classes, countries and contexts. And I put the uh, URL there. So in case you wanna check it out. It is um, founded by these three amazing women whom I have the pleasure of calling uh, my friends and mentors as well. So they're Mia Samora, Mahabali, and Catherine Cronin. You might remember her in the um, definition of open educational practice that I showed earlier. So um, they're the ones who created this equity and bound um, site so that they can engage in more community building, um, share with other educators on how they can foster better learning engagement for students. And then this one is another project called Virtually Connecting. Virtually Connecting brings academic conferences to those people who might not have the chance to attend it in person. So it is basically a conversation between those who are in the conference and the virtual audience from whenever, we're Ever they may be in the world. So basically, there's a lot of conversations and interactions with the presenters and attendees that sort of mimics the hallway spontaneous conversations that we might have when we are attending a face-to-face -face conference. 
So I've participated in a lot of virtually connecting sessions in the various open education conferences that I have been in and really is um, it really democratizes attendance of conference because it brings it to those people who might not otherwise have the chance to attend it. And then there's also the Open Syllabus Project. So Open Syllabus is a nonprofit research organization that collects and analyzes millions of syllabi to support novel teaching and learning applications. Open Syllabus helps instructors develop classes and libraries to manage collections and library presses or um, university presses develop books. It supports students and lifelong learners in their exploration of topics and other fields that they might be interested in. And currently now, um, Open, open Syllabus has 9 million um, English language syllabi from over 140 countries. So this one is really worthy to check out too. Um, yeah, so this one is the marginal syllabus. Um, this one was created in 2016 by Remy Kalir from CU Denver and Joe Dillon from the Denver Writing Project. The marginal syllabus facilitates public conversation among educators in marginal discursive spaces via social annotation using hypothesis as a tool. It supports educators with the use of open source technology as well. So over 500 educators have participated in marginal syllabus programming, both in K-12 classroom educators, both K-12 classroom educators, and university-based teacher educators as well. And then there's, of course, this the, o, the OER world map. So this interactive map facilitates exchange of data, experiences, and ideas between different people and open education communities. Anyone can share their work on OER, open education, OER policy, events, research, and other projects. The goal here is to help influence decision maker decision making processes by making a case for open education and its affordances. So there's a lot of things that you can see here in the OER world map. It's very interactive and you can also there's also a section here where you can see OER policy world map so that you can um, see what other countries you know, in the world are doing um, regarding open education policies on a national level. And then here is the hashtag OER for COVID website. So to minimize the impact of COVID-19, the Commonwealth of Learning and the OER University are joining forces with the UNESCO um, and the International Council for Open and Distance Education to support educational institutions around the world that are transitioning to online learning using OER. So this is an open online community support network for educators tasked with transitioning to online learning. So in here, in this site, you can share OER enabled online courses for reuse and remixing by institutions around the world. So why I believe that open education through open education of resources can be a driver, lever, and catalyst for change in education. It is not an answer to the systemic problems that we experience in higher education and education writ large. Foremost of this is the continued disinvestment in education due, due to shrinking um, state budget allocations. The notion that education is a public good is increasingly being eroded 
by the influence of neoliberalism with its focus on revenue generation, students as consumers, and academic capitalism, among others. Perhaps we can also consider how practicing open can be a privilege, how it can perpetuate inequities in education, and in what ways educational opportunities are still not open to many of our minoritized and underserved students. However, I still believe that open education has the potential to empower educators, students, and certainly librarians leading OER projects to develop, practice, and embody openness transparency and collaborative knowledge creation. There is definitely a lot of good that open education through the use of OER and open educational practices can do. It enables us to be better educators, have conversations and create an online community built, built on the shared commitment to make learning not only engaging and meaningful, but liberatory as well. There's a long road ahead of us, but we can all imagine or reimagine a better world that awaits. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening this far. And I look forward to our conversations later. And that later time has arrived. Uh, thank you, uh, Regina. Uh, we've gotten a, a number of uh, interesting questions and, and feedback uh, from your talk. Uh, one that uh, you started to answer in, in Whova and wanted to give you a, a chance to uh, expound on uh, a little bit more verbally. Um, thank you for sharing your expertise. Uh, where would you recommend an institution store its open educational resource materials uh, so that it's accessible and safe, digitally preserved into the future? Yeah, so thank you for that. And thank you, everyone. Um, I think it was Ian, right, who, who asked that question. So the answer to that is a little complicated. So the one that I just put in the chat box is just like a start. So a lot of um, OER materials are deposited, and I'm doing a heavy coat here, um, in um, OER repositories. So, so for example, you have OER Commons, you have Merlot, you have Open SUNY. So those, those um, repositories refer back to where the OER resides, right? So they are actually not repositories as you know the, the, the real meaning of the word repository. They're just referatory because they refer you to the OER. Now, um, the OER itself is stored in the institution's platform. So for example, um, we have Pressbooks. We use Pressbooks and a lot of academic institutions use Pressbooks as a way to create um, open textbooks and other um, OER materials. So those are discoverable by these repositories. Now, the issue here is that there's really no site, like integrated site or a space where you as an OER creator can deposit for like preservation in perpetuity. There's none, right? And so, um, and, and, and that, is, that is an issue because you have all this um, corpus of OER um, located all over, right? And, and, and also one thing that complicates that is that a lot of these materials are remixable. Although, you know, although it's openly licensed and there's best practices for attributing uh, those resources, um, at the end of the day, I, I kind of consider it as a smoothie, you know, so if you have a 
if you have all these different fruits and you blend them, then it becomes a smoothie. And so where, where does it start? You know, so where does it end? And so, um, yeah, that's, that's kind of like the short answer to the preservation. There's, there's really um, no centralized place where um, all of these materials can be found and preserve so it just kind of like links to the the many different uh places where that oer resides boy the the ephemeral nature of that makes the preservation hairs on the back of my neck stand up so ah. that sounds like quite the challenge mm -hmm. um another question do you know uh, or have maybe heard examples of uh, whether it's possible possible to make a textbook open after it's uh, already been published in a conventional non-open way by a <laughs> large and well-known scientific publisher, uh, and and the questioner uh, uh, is an MSU graduate and and adds a go green at the end of that. Okay, so I actually have plenty of examples. So um, when I was still working at LCC, I had a faculty who created um, a book on abnormal psychology. So he was under contract with a publisher that starts with P. And so, um, uh, but I think at some point there was, um, the publisher doesn't want to publish that anymore. And so he was able to get the, um, he was able to um, make the, the author publisher contract so that um, he got the, the copyright back. So yeah, so instead of transferring the copyright, now he got the copyright back. And so um, it's not publisher owned anymore. So what he did was since I have the copyright back and you can only put a CC license, a Creative Commons license in materials that you own the copyright for, right? Because um, CC license work on top of copyright. It's essentially a, a copyright permission, right? If, um, right the CC license. And so we were able to publish his um, textbook as an OER. So had a CC BY license. And um, there was also our first open textbook at MSU um, is from a faculty who used to have this relationship with the publisher and got the license back. And so he was the first um, faculty that published um, in our Pressbooks publishing platform. That's on financial management. And, and it, it, it really has opened, opened his eyes into like, oh my gosh, why did I not do this? So, and, and he really got a lot of um, positive feedback, not just with his students, but also colleagues who um, really wanted to adopt that, that uh, material. So it can be done. Um, just make sure that the copyright is um, with the author. Because, yeah, because we Come cannot back. license that. Great. Um do you have any advice for a, a small institution that's just starting the, the OER journey? Uh, it, it seems overwhelming um, and meeting with uh, faculty uh, uh, and, and student government representatives, uh, meeting with disciplines one by one and assisting with classes. Uh, but it just seems like there's an overwhelming number of directions that, that one could go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I've been there and done that. And I, and I really, I know, I know your pain. It is hard. It is hard, but um, I think you have to do it incrementally so you don't get overwhelmed. So first of all, you have to, to really know what is your goal for, for doing an OER program in your university? 
a lot or community college. So a lot of this is driven by uh, the problem of textbook affordability, right? You want to provide more access to students. So I, my, my, my goal is really to do it in such a way that it snowballs. So start with those um, faculty who are more likely to, to do OER or to use OER. So concentrate on those disciplines too that have um, a robust OER um, materials already. So a lot of that are the top 20 um, introductory college courses in the US. So um, because you would get a lot of adoptions that way since um, those are high enrollment, a lot of times it's, it's um, uh, multi-section classes and it's introductory course, which means that a lot of students take that. So you have intro to psychology, you have calculus, you have algebra. We have a lot of that already that can be used um, by, by faculty straight up. So OpenStax is one example. So, um, and then one of the, the things too that, that probably helps a lot is if you have institutional support. Because while OER are free materials, this is not free to produce. So there's labor involved in creating an OER. So you really need that institutional support that allows faculty to engage in OER creation. So um, when I was at LCC, we had a one time half a million dollar allocation um, by our board of trustees. So I was able to use that money to um, help our faculty as they engage with OER. And now with MSU, I also have a budget um, annually that I um, can use to, to help faculty um, engage with OER creation. And that really helps. Great, yeah, um, boy. If 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 the institution can get involved in that kind of commitment, uh, that that can make a, a world of difference. Mm -hmm. um, thank you for for mentioning how open publishing and and open education can perpetuate some kinds of of privilege. Can you tell us more about how technology organizations workflows can cause this? So, so first of all, not many institutions have the capacity and financial resources to engage with, um, you know, to use this technology. Because a lot of what, what is done in OER is technology mediated, right? So we, um, we have platforms that allow faculty to author this open textbook. So right now, um, the most, a uh, widespread platform that's uh, used is Pressbooks mm. because it's accessible um, and it um, allows faculty to embed different kinds of media in the OER that they're creating. So um, Pressbooks itself is not expensive, but you know you need you need investment from the institution to do that. Um, there are also investment, not just in the technology, but in the expertise. So as you know, librarians are leading the way in, uh, in OER, right? Especially in um, uh, higher ed. But the thing is a lot of librarians work is added on. So OER is added into the already full plate of librarians and that was you know, that was my case when I was at, at uh, my previous institution. So I was head of tech services and systems, and I was also OER project manager. And that, and that in itself is a separate position already, right? So um, it, I think the investment is not just on the technology, but the people who are making things happen. And that really is the problem.
it goes back to the labor, right? Yes, yes, because these are free. But again, as I mentioned, the creation itself on the faculty side is not. And the people who manage the back end, it certainly is not. And so if, if the institution is serious about um, you know, affordability, access, equity, student success, they have to put their, um, their um, you know, th that commitment to, to that, to that um, work. The, so. the institutions got to buy into that. And, and I'm, I'm looking uh, down at a, a chat in um, uh, a chat message uh, mm -hmm. about, you know, how much leeway does an adjunct faculty member have in making these kinds of changes when it maybe has to go in front of a curriculum committee or something like that? Yeah, very good question, really is. Because um, a lot of the times the decisions are not for the faculty to make on their own, right? And so there's, there's this committee within the program that does um, the, the, the decision on what to adopt. So my strategy for that is to meet with the department and I do a lot of that. So say for example, you hone in on the intro to psych. So um, in my previous institution, that's the number one high enrollment course. So I met with the program faculty and I just basically provided them a buffet of OER uh, on intro to psych. So I gave them like six to choose from. And at the time they were um, thinking of um, changing their uh, textbook anyways. And so that just added um, a, a layer of choice for them. And so I gave them that choice. I am not going to tell them that, you know, use this. It's all, you know, academic freedom is very important. So the, the enemy of OER is if you mandate it to faculty, because you cannot. Always is encourage. So encourage, recommended. And when you do that, we will support you. So um, yeah, so they chose from the six um, candidates that I, I gave them. And they, they, did, they did the choosing as if they were choosing a publisher textbook, because you should, right? It doesn't matter whether it's an OER or a publisher textbook. You have to do the necessary vetting to make sure that it addresses your student learning outcomes. And in the end, they chose OpenStax Intro to Psychology, and they never looked back. Mm. So all of the all of the the sections that were teaching that um, adopted that um, OER. So. <clears throat> yes. <laughs> There's a, a question about how OER can be measured, but I, I want to stay on this theme of, of adjuncts uh, for a moment. Um, there's a, a comment and a question from someone who's a, an adjunct at uh, this person's institution uh, and would love the idea of using OER resources. Uh, the issue that comes up for this person is, is the quality of the resources. Uh, do you have any ideas on how the OER community can improve this pain point? Is, is it peer review? Is it financial support for creation? How, how, do, we, how do we improve what's out there? And, and that really is the ethos of OER, right? The idea that um, it is remixable. So you build upon, um, you build upon what others already did. And so um, with, with quality, quality is really relative, right? There are um, publisher textbooks that are not of sufficient quality and there's also OER that are not, right? And so um, quality really is subjective and it depends on the person who is evaluating it. Of course, there are, you know, there are criteria for evaluating OER the same way as you evaluate um, a learning material that you are going to assign as required, right? And so, um, I lost my train of thought. So I think <laughs> that that, that um, kind of like answers what, what um, our, yeah, yeah, that 
um, have you seen instances where um, different kind of funding models for supporting, again, coming back to the labor, to support the labor of, of creating these resources? What, what kind of models ha have worked there? So a lot of the funding comes from the institution itself. So for example, um, at, at MSU, um, we, we pay our faculty 1,500 for adopting an OER. So it's like, okay, I adopt it at, as is, but there's still work involved in that, right? So you have to essentially redesign your course to accommodate the new OER. And then we also have a funding for um, remixing. So if there's like, if you plan on remixing two or more OER, um, there's also a category for that in the OER application. So for faculty who are creating OER, which is a lot of our faculty at MSU does that, we do um, $4,000 um, as, as grant for faculty. Um, there's a new um, category of award that I have created for this round. It's called um, scaling up. Scaling up means that um, the, the faculty who's applying for the award has the intention of having all the sections of that particular course use OER. So that's a little bit more um, like, like the higher um, award amount, 5,000. Um, but what is really good is that OER is gaining traction like nationally. So I don't know if you know of the, the federal, um, the federal grant that is incorporated in the budget now. Oh. Yes, so it started in 2018. It's called the Open Textbook Pilot Grant. So it's now in the third year and it is administered by the, the, the US Department of Education. So for this year, um, so it's built in into our budget, right? It started as 5 million um, in 2018. And um, in the 2020 round that was just announced, it's $6 million. And they awarded that to four institutions. So um, let me see, I wrote that those institutions. So that's the West Hills Lee Moore um, College in California, and they were awarded $2 million. And the, 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 the focus of their application is um, to create OER that are culturally relevant for the Hispanic population that they are serving. And then also Middlesex um, County College, they got $1.4 million. And wow. that, yeah, and that's for OER, that is specifically for STEM, STEM discipline. And then the Louisiana Board of Regents um, got uh, 1.98 million and their focus is to create OER for dual enrollment. So, and then the last recipient is um, UT, University of Texas in Arlington, and they got about $582,000. And this is for transportation science. So, and, and we will have another application period for the 2021 um, grant, and it's gonna ramp up from 6 million to 7 million. And, and that work in itself was brought about by the advocacy of the open education community. So, you know, it's, it's a way by which we can um, enable affordability, access, and equity in you know, college education, and that is big. So that is big. So, um, I mean, we are getting there. We want it to be a little higher than 6 million, but you know, it's a start. It's a place to start. Uh, that's wonderful. I, you know, I, I, I have one question that um, I, I don't, I, I know we've reached the top of the hour. Uh, and so I, I um, if you can address it briefly and then maybe we can ask you to, to uh, give us a, a more in-depth uh, question, but but that is the the the, the measurement uh, again the, the the labor that's involved in this 
uh, how do we assess the value of what's been contributed by a, a faculty member? What's the, what's the impact factor of, that we can calculate for open educational resources? Okay, so there's actually a framework by which we measure efficacy of OER. So that's cost, outcome, usage, and perception. So um, cost, of course, is how much cost savings does the student realize when using OER? And we have like um, a dollar amount that we equate. So it's like $100 per student enrolled in the courses that use OER. So, um, and then outcomes is um, the measure of how well the students uh, did in the class with the use of OER. Of course, this one you really cannot um, have, uh, you know, it's, it, you, you can't really do a 100% uh, determination that the use of OER really led to this, right? But um, what we do is we get all the students that are using OER and look at their final grades, the rate of um, drop, withdrawal, and incomplete. And research show that students who are taking OER have um, less drop fail of incomplete rates. So yeah, and, and, and in terms of usage, usage is um, how did the students uh, use the OER? So did they use it like every day? Did they use it like once a month? So we, we have those metrics that um, we use in order to measure efficacy and then perceptions. So this is important because um, research show that, you know, in terms of perception, it's better, better or the same as a publisher textbook. The, the worst, kind of like worse, it's very, very low, you know, that, mm -hmm. that, that uh, perception. And so you would think, right, if it's, if it's just equal to a publisher textbook, then what is the value proposition of paying for a $250 intro to biology textbook? So I think I'll end with that. Yes, <laughs> yes. Um, thank you, Regina, for, for sharing your experience with open educational resources and open educational practices. Your, your enthusiasm for this topic is, is infectious. Uh, and I can tell you that uh, just glancing down at, at the, the chat, uh, have, have loved this, this time with you. Um, and you've given us a lot to think about with the, the growth of OER and that intersection with, with the library technology world. Uh, and so much to refer back to in, in the slides uh, and in the recording. Um, we're going to take a bit of a break. It's about uh, four minutes past the hour. Uh, so this will be a six minute break. And then we'll start up again with lightning talks at 10 minutes past the hour. That'll be 1.10 PM Eastern time with your next MC, Daniel Stanford. Uh, Regina, again, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Peter. Have a nice day. Mm -hmm. Bye. <laughs>